I mean, it came up as a question of how much context do we want to give the readers? It came, it also came up as how much do we want to explain the Arabic words that are used or mm -hmm. referenced? Um, and I, I, I sort of, we have, everyone has Google. Like I feel like, <laughs> you know, if, if it's like, I feel, I feel, I don't feel too bad about making the audience do a little bit of work yeah, yeah. Um, because I do a lot of work for a lot of the literature that I read mm -hmm. you know which is about well doesn't matter but it's more mainstream <laughs> kind of stories that like I've you know I've had to put in a lot of imagination to imagine like you know like what is it like to be like an 11 year old white you know young boy living mm -hmm. in whatever you know so like I think that it's it's not asking too much and I, and I do think whatever work is going to be put into it is like well-spent time because yeah. these are pretty big events that have happened. Uh, Hala Alyan is a Palestinian-American poet, novelist, and clinical psychologist. Her work has appeared widely, and she's won numerous awards for her writing, including a Landon Foundation Fellowship. She's published three collections of poetry, Atrium, Four Cities, and most recently Hijra, which was the winner of the Crab Orchard series in poetry. Salt Houses is her first novel and was just announced as the winner of the Arab American Book Award in fiction. Woo! Yeah. Really, really wonderful. Um, and thank you to all of you that came out on this. Hi, Emily. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week it is. I was telling Shuchi, I was just in Maine and we drove down and we've been listening to true crime podcasts for the last four hours and we're stopping here and then we're continuing to New York so I'm just like all over the place but... I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to read a passage, obviously, and I'm going to give a little bit of context. So it, it's basically, Salt Houses is a, is a multi-generational story um, of a Palestinian family. And it begins in the 1960s with the family's matriarch in what is now the West Bank and follows the trajectory of the family through different perspectives in different points in time, oftentimes in different um, cities through several displacements. So begins in the 60s, ends in present day with the then matriarchs, now great-grandchildren. So the section that I'm going to read from takes place in 2006 in Beirut um, through the perspective of one of those great-grandchildren. Her name is Lina. And she is, I believe, 11. And she she lives in Boston with her parents. And in the summers, they all, the, whole, the, the scattered family all kind of reunites in Beirut, which is something that you'll find a lot with Palestinian um, diaspora communities, is that the family members end up scattered everywhere. And usually there's like one meeting point that kind of ends up taking place. So for this particular family, it ends up being Lebanon. And what happens is that the war breaks out, um, the 2006 war, and they end up being stuck there, basically, as they're trying to figure out whether they're going to be evacuated or not. So she's spending her days with her cousin, who's her age. His name is Zayn, and he lives in Beirut, and he um, goes to school there, and she's trying to convince him to sneak out against the wishes of the family and get some cigarettes, because they're 11. <laughs> The last two weeks have been mind-numbing. The electricity cuts out every few hours like it does every summer she comes to Beirut. But this summer, she and Zane can no longer wander outside, go to the video store down the street where the AC is always on, nor can they go to Malik's to get ice cream or down to the beach. The adults have even forbidden them from going onto the balcony. They still sneak out sometimes for the breeze. Watch television, the adults keep telling them. But whenever they do put in a movie, drawing all the curtains and sitting on the tiled floor where it is coolest, they rarely get to finish it. They'll be halfway through when the adults rampage in, ordering them to move and yelling about crumbs. Go to your rooms, they keep saying. Everyone is distracted and upset, the trash can full of cigarette butts. Summers aren't supposed to be like this. This is what Lena thinks over and over when she wakes up before she goes to sleep. Summers are supposed to be about swimming and spending nights bowling and going out to dinner. And this summer, this summer was supposed to be the best because she was finally 11 and the adults were going to allow her and Zan to go to the beach alone. But now it's ruined. The summer is just heat and mosquitoes and the bombings that sometimes make the windows shake. All the adults do is talk about evacuation and warships and explosions. They watch men yell on the television and shake their heads. It's been two weeks. 
Two weeks since Lena woke to Zayn saying her name, his face afraid. Wake up, wake up. Something's wrong. Her first thought was that the adults had found the ants that she and Zayn were capturing with sugar cubes inside bottles. Is it the ants, she asked, sitting up. He shook his head. No, something's happening in the airport. Your mom says to get up. The adults are freaking out. The next few hours are chaos. Noises of traffic and honking below them, voices carrying from the street. The adults watch television and yelled at Lena, even if she went near a window. We don't know what's going to happen, her mother kept saying, her voice taut. The news reports showed the same images over and over. Streaks of smoke from the airport, an old man talking about prisoners, an airplane dropping a bomb like an abdomen from, like an egg from its abdomen. Khal Turiham, her favorite aunt, made plates of bread in Lebanon. They ate on the couches, eyes fixed on the television. The conversation was cryptic and urgent. You don't think they'll fight back. It'd be suicide. Thank God Mama's not here. Can you imagine Mama here? I think they should return the men. I can't believe you'd say that. Without the airport, how could hush, not in front of the children? People are driving through Syria. The UN won't let this continue. When has the UN ever done anything? One of the men on the news wore a white robe. He had twinkling eyes and a long beard, and Lena recognized him from posters near the mall in Beirut. The billboard showed him speaking, his hand outstretched as though about to swat a fly, and behind him a landscape of mountains. Back in Boston, she was once at her friend Susan's house, and they were playing in the living room while her father watched the news. The bearded man came on. Barbarian, Susan's father had said. He spat the word from his mouth like an olive pit. Lena's understanding of all of it is half-formed, hazy. She knows there are good guys and bad guys, like in Spider-Man movies and the Sherlock Holmes books that she and Susan swap. She's heard, of course, her parents talking about Israel and Palestine, wars and land and people dying. Lena knows that someone is wrong, and that's why everything's happening. The airport burning, the men on the television, the rumbles that resound every few hours in nighttime, just yesterday shaking a bathroom window so hard they woke to it shattering. She's afraid she might die, but more than that, she's afraid everyone else, especially her father and Zan, will die, and then she'll be alone, like that girl in the movie she watched a while ago, who survived a plane crash in the tropics. The adults won't really elaborate. Only Khal Turihan pays any attention to them, asking them if they'd like to sit with her. Several days ago, she found them on the balcony, swaying on the porch swing, and instead of scolding them or telling on them, she just sat down and read verses from her small, worn Quran. There's a war, she told them. We can call it a war. People are fighting. Bad things are happening. People are dying, but we, we're lucky. We're safe here, and we can't do anything but wait and pray. They'd sat out there, the three of them, for nearly an hour, the sun setting over the water, Khal Turiham not flinching once, her voice strong and even as she went over the surahs. Oh Allah, she said at the very end, please keep these darlings safe. Lena has always felt her difference glow through, like something phosphorescent beneath her skin. Her mother's Iraqi, her father's Palestinian, lives in Boston, comes to Beirut in the summers. Weeks ago, Lena and Zayn were getting ice cream at Malik's when the most popular girl at Zayn's school, Marie, overheard Lena talking about going to Shbel. You're not even Lebanese. Lena's, M Marie's voice rung out loud and sharp. Several patrons in the store turned to stare. Taken aback, Lena stammered through an answer. We have an apartment here. We come every summer. The other girl's mouth twisted meanly. You think that matters? With your weird accent in Arabic? A couple of girls behind her tittered. You think your people deserve to be here? My mom told me all about them. Palestinians killed my uncle during the war. Lena felt dozens of eyes upon her, heard whispering. Zan froze like a deer to her side. And Lena felt really confused, speechless, wanting to say something about how no one ever really talked about being Palestinian in her house, the same way no one really talked about being Iraqi. That when either set of grandparents came over, they spoke of things like villages and years with a sort of mournful resignation as though the places and times in question had just vanished. She wanted to say something about how she'd never even been to Iraq or Palestine, that she only knew Boston and Beirut, that this was her home in the summers and Marie must be wrong because whoever it was that killed her uncle, it wasn't Lena's people, whatever that meant. But her voice felt ghosted and so she said nothing at all. It's been two weeks. Two weeks of trying to convince Zan for once in his life to do anything. 
two weeks of Zin, please, please, we're not going to get caught. We're not going to get caught until finally he says, well, if we do, it's on you. They sneak down the stairs like the spies of their favorite movie, tiptoeing down each step of the building. At the front entrance of the building, they peek around for Hassan, the doorman, but he's nowhere in sight. Lena steps out first, stands for a moment on the pavement, marveling at how easily they did it. We're outside. What? she asks, noticing Zan's frown. It's empty, he says. And looking at the street around them, Lena sees that indeed many of the stores are shuttered, parking spots bare. This road is usually bustling with university students and older couples, men on mopeds zipping between gridlock traffic. But now there's only a lone car driving along hurriedly as though not wanting to be caught here. Lena thinks again of the girl in the tropics. It's like something from a zombie film, Zan says. Where the world has already ended, Lena thinks but doesn't say. She swallows. We'll go to Abu Dhafi's real quick and come back. He's always open. She turns left, walking towards the ribbon of shuttered storefronts, and she can hear her cousin's pause and his capitulation, then his footsteps behind her. They walk along the sidewalks, past the fancy hotel with lushly flowering plants flanking its entrance. Lena thinks about all those fancy rooms. Are they empty now? The thought makes her sad. The bellman catches her eye, tilts his head quizzically. What are these kids doing out here? She can hear him thinking. She looks away, quickens her pace. There's something queasy in the air, like a tar-like tension in the warm dusk. The few people that cross their path are mostly men, scruffy-looking, distracted. When they reach the enclave of delis and bakeries, she thinks for a moment that she was mistaken. Zane was right, everything's closed, but then she sees the door. A cracked white sign above announcing Abu Rafi slightly ajar, the usual display of flowers and fruits outside missing. Inside, a brown woman stands in front of the cheese aisle. Somehow, unmistakably, Lena knows that she is a maid, Sri Lankan, though she is dressed oddly. In neither the uniform nor one of the pretty saris Lena has seen maids wear on their days off. This woman wears an ill-fitting dress, falling past her knees, the shoulders and bust too large for her. It is as though she just tried it on to see what it would look like. Her dark hair spiders past her waist, a handful of liras in her fist. The store is empty save for the woman in Abu Rafi who looks grim and cheerless behind the cash register. Many of the shelves are bare. Sometimes, before the airport bombing, when she and Zan would come here running errands for their parents, Abu Rafi would slip them a Snickers or a Fanta, but now he just looks at them blankly. What is it? Tell your parents we're out of meat. Milk, too. Sold the last of it this morning. Those idiots at the port promised a new shipment, but the bastards have blocked the ships. Lena finds that she cannot speak. Their adventure suddenly seems so stupid. But to her astonishment, Zan clears his throat and steps forward. A pack of Marlboros, the green ones. It's for my mom, he adds when Abu Rafi hesitates. The man pauses, then shrugs, pulls out a pack. 150, he says. Zan offers him a trickle of coins, and Lena watches with amazement as Abu Rafi slides the cigarette pack across the counter and into her cousin's hands. Now run along, this isn't a babysitting service. Hey! Lena and Zan jump. They follow Abu Rafi's glare to the woman, fingering a packet of peanuts. No more wait, wait, you understand, he says in broken English. You pick something, you pay, you leave. Lena has never seen an expression like the woman's. Frantic, vehement. They watch her grab a motley of items, spicy nuts, a bag of pita, a wheel of soft cheese, and go to the cashier. And something keeps Lena frozen in the doorway. Zan by her side now, the pack of cigarettes forgotten in his grip. Something keeps them watching as Abu Rafi piles the groceries in front of him, punches numbers into a large calculator. The woman stares at a spot on the floor. 15, 23, 48,000 lira, he concludes. Then, in condescending English, now you pay. The woman drops the crumpled bills on the counter, her eyes still downcast. What is this, a joke? This is ten. The woman remains silent. Speak up, girl. You think this is a charity? You go tell your madame that she has to... No, madame. The woman suddenly explodes. Her hair shudders around her. She snaps her head up. No, madame. No, sir. They've left. Well, that's none of my business, Abu Rafi grumbles in Arabic. They left five days ago. Now that she's begun talking, it's like a levee breaking, her hands moving quickly. I wake up. 
they're gone. I wait, wait for lunch, for dinner, the sun goes down. I stayed awake one night, two nights, I wait. I take the laundry down, I soak the rice, but they don't come back. They hear the war and they left, they left. Here her voice falters. They left me behind. I looked everywhere for passport, can't find it. I tried to call the embassy, they say no one can help. They say stay inside, away from windows. I cannot call my children, I cannot go home. The food is finishing, there is no electricity. We should go, Zane whispers. But Lena is rooted in the doorway, as though someone glued her flip-flops to the linoleum. Abu Rafi and the woman stare at each other. There is no money, the woman says simply. They left. And Abu Rafi's face darkens, darkens with anger, disgust, exhaustion, exhaustion at his store being the only grocery open, at another long day of telling people there is no more flour, no more meat, cursing the Israelis every time the rumbles begin from the south. 48,000 lira, he repeats. Lena wants to punch him or get out. But madame and sir, 48,000 lira, you think I don't have children? He lets out a long string of Arabic curses. You want help, you find it somewhere else, not here. Look around. He gestures at the paltry supplies on the shelves. Someone wants bread, they pay. Eggs, apples, cheese, they pay, they pay. Spittle dots his lips. I help one Sri Lankan, ten more at my door tomorrow. The woman flinches. She stares at the crumpled bills. With one hand, she smooths her hair from her face. Her profile could be on a coin, the forehead uninterrupted. The bread, she finally says. Only the bread. Her voice could cool molten glass. This is who you are, she seems to be saying at the man. Look at this wrinkled bill on the corner. My unwashed hair for the rest of your life, you will remember this moment and what you did with it. It is not until the woman has paid, swung by Lena and Zan with her bag of pita, as though they're invisible and left, the door slamming shut behind her that Abu Rafi finally notices the two of them. He looks at them for a long moment before he speaks. Go, he finally says. Run along home. Thanks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I actually love that Lena chapter. I have a couple of questions just from that chapter oh, really? alone. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think there's there's just so much happening um, in that particular chapter, both with this idea of um, of her family never acknowledging that they're Palestinian, mm -hmm. um, and I think that was that really struck me when I read that, particularly because the Yakub family talks so much about politics all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always watching TV, even in that in that part in in Lebanon. They're they're always they're absorbed with the news, mm -hmm. and and yet they're not connecting it directly to their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about that a little bit with this particular family, why they have that disconnect? I think there's, I mean, I, I think this is an experience that I've seen in a lot of the diasporic community where either there is, I mean, obviously it's a range, so I'm just, you know, these are two ends of the, the spectrum, but what I've seen often is either an intense identification with the, identity a reclaiming of the identity a making the identity something that fits you know your the geography of where you are the history of where you are etc or a sort of distancing of it um, and I think that the latter oftentimes is survival mm -hmm. kind of depending on where you are and where you're growing up and you know I mean I, I we we were in Oklahoma for a few years when I was a kid and like my name was Holly and my dad's name was Nick and my mom's <laughs> name was Janine and those are not our names <laughs> spoiler alert <laughs> Um, like I, th I think, do think that there's to a certain extent it becomes a matter of survival, and I also think for the Yakub family in particular, there is this really intense, unspoken, like this trauma that then becomes a festering wound of the brother um, mm -hmm. who passes away early on, and so for generations, and I'm really interested in intergenerational trauma and how it plays out. The way that that becomes inherited is a certain silence and a certain erasure of the self and of the identity of Palis of being Palestinian. Um, so I think for them there is this they're, they're, they're obviously you know this is a relatively well to do family right mm -hmm. so this is not mm -hmm. like you know it's a middle class family that had the means to be able to get passports to be able to leave to be able to you know like uproot and like develop lives elsewhere um, 
so they they're plugged into current events and they're plugged into history and they're plugged into the po- political landscape of the world but i think at the same time it does it is it's from a certain distance mm-hmm. and i do think that's it's it's a self preservation yeah. for them yeah yeah definitely and and even um you know when lena is later in the market um i think what's so great about her is she starts to kind of make those connections. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I don't think that anybody else, at least the perspectives that we're seeing, because we see about a dozen, a maybe while, more yeah, yeah, but... perspectives um, over 50 years, mm-hmm. of different characters um, who, starting from 1967 mm-hmm. to, what is it, 2014, mm-hmm. we're kind of seeing the, this, family's, um, this family's life. And, um, and so at that moment when she is watching um, watching this woman, I, I just thought that was so interesting because we are so we are so much a part of this of this particular family, and and they are wealthy, um, and and so that there are a couple of moments where they're maids mm-hmm. and characters. Like, mm-hmm. can you so oh, can yeah. you talk about oh, yeah. about those characters? Sure. They, there's another. I think a generation before. There's another. Yeah. There was no way to tell this story. I mean, there, there's no way to tell this story without speaking. <laughs> without speaking about the people that are housekeepers, without speaking about the people that are drivers, without speaking mm-hmm. about the labor. For, I mean, and I think that that's, you know, I think it's really oftentimes comfortable to be very aware and settled into the ways that we are marginalized and we are oppressed as individuals. And it's a lot harder to discuss the nuance within which we participate in the marginalization of other groups mm-hmm. of people. Mm-hmm. And so I, I actually always read that, not all of them, I often read that on purpose ever since I read it once by accident and then I had a couple of people come and talk to me afterwards and were like, why are you reading that section of all the sections? Like oh. this story about Palestine. I'm like, yeah, well, the story of Palestine includes the story of the diaspora, which includes people that do have money to, you know, in, in some cases who are involved in like mm-hmm. the exploitation of other groups of people. Um, so ever since then, just out of stubbornness, I like to read it all the time. <laughs> Beca- because I, cause it's not, it's not, you know, it's not like a moment Granted, it's not a moment that really captures like, you know, the ways in which Palestinians are oppressed necessarily. But I do think I mean, it's that idea of like oppression anywhere is oppression everywhere, which is it doesn't it's important to show all the different ways that this plays out in that region. And it plays Mm -hmm. out with this family and this family does intersect with, you know, when they first go to America, I do think that some of the family members don't have a lot of money. And so there are there there's a little bit of a shift in the socioeconomic status, which happens in immigration. But I do think for most of the book. (laughs) They are intersecting with people from different parts of the world who have less means than them, um, and in, in an almost like offhanded capacity, which mm-hmm. is what you see if you go. I mean, that's what happened in Lebanon. Is a lot of people left, and they left their um, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. I saw someone I haven't seen in a really long time. Um, (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) they that a lot of people did essentially do that. I mean, they they the the war happened. People left with the passports of the the oftentimes the women that were in their employment, and they just left. And now, sorry, this is a whole separate thing. But but now, (laughs) a lot of those women cannot go back and work in Lebanon. Because they got they they got penalties put against them because they weren't accounted for during the war, so which is like what? Why did they take their passports? Because they take because a lot of the times the passports are taken in general. Oh, like I if see. you so, you know what I, like people arrive yeah. and people will say, well, it's a liability, and you know if this person like you know if they run away or something, it's like shouldn't you be asking why a person would run away while mm-hmm. you're employing them more mm-hmm. than like what what you're doing with their passport? Anyway, um, but yeah, so a lot of people were left behind. Yeah, um, and they're. I, I've, they seem to be South Asian too, mostly South Asian, yeah. which was which was yeah. interesting. So, yeah. and even um, Lena, their family has a maid that she's very close to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, that yeah, so that's the that's the 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 maid of Zane's family, mm-hmm. and so that's the maid that she sees every summer, and she becomes really affectionate with. And I think there there is a section which I I usually actually I usually skip over because I don't have time, which I could have read it, um, where she talks about being very close to Tika, and then like talking to her about. You know, like, why, why don't you do this here? Why can't we, whatever? And she's just like, because this isn't where I live. This mm-hmm. isn't my home. And that's like this sort of mo- moment of tension for this young child who I think starts to become a little bit more aware of these dynamics. Yeah. yeah. So in this chapter, we have Boston, we have Beirut. But throughout this, we are going, going to Paris, mm-hmm. um, to Amman, to Kuwait City. Um, we start in 
Nablus, and then we end in Jaffa. Mm -hmm. So talk about, well, first cities as as the kind of place that um, migration happen, tends to happen, and, mm -hmm. and why those cities and and just about cities in general as, as the place for these families. I mean, I think the, those cities, the thing I lifted the most from my family's experience, I couldn't really do too many characters based on family members because my family would murder me. Um, <laughs> but I, I was able to sort of borrow and, and, and kind of, yeah, I mean, like I sort of borrowed the the geography mm -hmm. of their particular kind of immigration <coughs> and their particular displacement, which was, you know, people who were in what was Palestine in 47 and then went to what is now the West Bank and then 67 happened and then went to Kuwait or went to the Gulf. Like mm -hmm. there was a massive amount of Palestinian um, immigrants and refugees that went to the Gulf in the in the late 60s after the war. And so after Saddam invaded, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of displacement more than once. So mm -hmm. happening twice in a person's mm -hmm. lifetime or three times in a person's lifetime, which even when I read this, it sort of feels like this cruel irony of part of the dialogue is like, we'll drive through Syria, mm -hmm. you know, which is like that, that was a place of refuge, right? right. Um, in 2006, it was not that long ago, right? So in any case, so, you know, this idea of like, these people went to Kuwait and they just, they, that was their life. They're like, this is where I'm raising kids. This is where my kids are going to raise their kids. They just settled in. And then Saddam invaded. And it was just yet once again, like completely uprooted. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think Palestinians in, in Kuwait in particular got a really bad rap because Saddam sort of cushioned, like he kind of cushioned some of his ideology and also being very pro-Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And so some of that um, rhetoric back, yeah, it just backfired for a lot of Palestinians that were there. I forgot your question. Oh, it was, <laughs> no, I mean, I think... I, I am all about the tangents tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you're answering it. I mean, in oh, why cities, cities, why yes. cities, yeah. I mean, I guess, be, yeah, I don't know that you, I would have been able to tell a story of diaspora well without having the cities be like their own force of nature and kind mm -hmm. of their own characters. Um, and I, be, in part because of, well, so there's the intergenerational trauma and then like I'm saying, there's sort of the anglicizing of the self or the mm -hmm. Americanizing or the westernizing of the self and to see that take place, I had to have them end up in the West for at least a little bit of the mm -hmm. time, even if they ended up kind of going back. And then there's that tension in too of like, you know, all the people that go to the West, then kind of what my parents did, which is when we were like 13, were like, we're moving back to the Middle East. And then we moved back and it was just like, for us, it was like moving back. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, what am I moving back to? And now I'm I'm even more of like a stranger in this place where I'm supposed to, where people know my name, can pronounce my name now, but but I don't really feel connected in any other way. And so there's also, then you kind of find yourself in this borderland in more ways than one, I guess. Yeah, and cities seem like kind of, um, I, there is such a mix of, of cultures there. So <laughs> yeah. it is it is a little bit, maybe a little bit easier to move from city to city and yeah. Um, and what I, I, I'm forgetting what the parents' jobs were. A lot of it was university related, professors. Right? Yeah, professors, which yeah. I sort of like. You know, that was the easy route to take because <laughs> that because that sort of accounts for like you know it's relatively easy to find jobs if you are like a professor, and then you can that kind of translates mm -hmm. depending on where you are. Um, but yeah, a lot of them are are work within universities. So yeah. I want to go back a little bit and talk about Alia. So mm -hmm. if you want to just talk about, so Alia comes in the beginning. Um, she's the one who is, who gets married in the first chapter. And then we're kind of following her family. And, and just so she's kind of like, a, she started to remind me of Olive Kitteridge a little bit in that, you know, she's a force, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every time she enters a chapter, the energy sort of just like gathers around right. her. Um, so can you talk about that, about her specifically, um, yeah. her character and, and kind of what she goes through in Mustafa too, who's, yeah. that, that dynamic is sort of the heart of the novel in so many ways. So, so the story basically started, I mean, the novel basically started as a short story that was about Mustafa in um, 1963. So I was interested in writing like about a young man who lived in pre-67 war, pre, or pre-67, post-48 Palestine. Um, and kind of because that was a particularly tense time, I think, to be that age. And I just I like really fell in love with this character. I felt really reluctant to let go of this character. I would start to write about his mother and then his sister, who was Alia. And I became really interested in their dynamic. And I and I sort of knew 
this thing that the care I probably have an unhealthy relationship to my characters but I like kind of knew that they were going to lose their ha- I knew something was coming that they didn't know and then that made me feel like I couldn't walk away from the scene sort of um, so I felt so I just sort of felt compelled to keep writing and so I started writing backwards um, which is to the wedding scene mm-hmm. and, and you know kind of leading up to the and, and giving a little bit more context about the siblings relationship and then kind of took it from there and he sort of so Mustafa dies early in the book during the war and and kind of the shift of the story or the focus of the story sort of shifts to Alia to the sister who then becomes sort of the matriarch of this of this family has children of her own they have children of their own and I think that his death happens at such a crucial time in her life you know she finds out about it when she's visiting her her own sister their sister in in Kuwait and then her husband kind of (coughs) finds her and arrives in Kuwait a completely different and sort of devastated broken person after this um and then really I feel like the the family four generations afterwards is trying to put together this this trauma that nobody will speak about and nobody and so in the book Mustafa and Palestine kind of become sort of in a lot of ways metaphors for each other Mm -hmm. um which is yeah this like this wound that won't heal but she is I, I think she was really such a compelling character to write about Mm -hmm. uh, more than probably more than any of the other ones um and I've always been very it's funny because I I I don't really like domestic novels quote unquote like novels that spend a lot of time like describing see I don't like to write like I don't like to read them a lot um but I just I could I was writing this and I was just like this this is where all the stuff happens Mm -hmm. it's in the kitchen it's in the house Mm -hmm. it's like while you're folding the laundry that's life you know um so I kind of Changed my mind. <laughs> writing this book. Yeah. Um, well, and so you know, you're you're writing about about I, the domestic life a lot, mm-hmm. and I think that that to me, what was so great is is I was I was realizing how bad some of my history was, where I was like, well, what is happening at this moment? Because it's being alluded to, but mm-hmm. you don't actually go into the his, history lesson and then mm. down into the scene. You know, you're really kind of sticking close to the characters and, and what they're going through. And then there's allusions to what's happening in the outside world. So knowing that this is for an American audience, mm-hmm. how did you kind of balance that? Um, you know, knowing that maybe our, our history as far as what's going yeah. on in the Middle East, and, and it's particularly from the Palestinian perspective and the Palestinian experience, yeah. we're not going to have the same knowledge. So how did you kind of work on that? I think I was really, I mean, I think the blessing of the first book is that you don't think there's going to be an audience for it. <laughs> and so you're not really thinking about it as much. <laughs> I truly like, and I can tell you as someone trying to work on a second book that you don't, it doesn't continue. Um, <laughs> but like for the first, I, I really thought this was a short story that then turned into a longer short story, then turned into, I was still not saying novel and it was like 300 pages long. I was like, I'm working on this project. It's a little bit long. So I think for me, there wasn't a lot of thought while I was working on it about these sort of things. I was really writing it as if I was going to give it to my brother to read at the mm-hmm. end, you know. Um, and... And then when the time came to start looking for agents and then found the agent and then started looking at different publishing houses, that definitely did come up. I mean, it came up as a question of how much context do we want to give the readers? It came, it also came up as how much do we want to explain the Arabic words that are used or mm-hmm. referenced? Um, and I, I, I sort of, we ha- everyone has Google. Like, I feel like, <laughs> it, you know, if, if it's, like, I feel, I feel, I don't feel too bad about making the audience do a little bit of work yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. because I do a lot of work for a lot of the literature that I read mm-hmm. you know which is about well it doesn't matter but it's a more mainstream <laughs> kind of stories that like I've you know I've had to put in a lot of imagination to imagine like you know like what is it like to be like an 11 year old white you know young boy living mm-hmm. in whatever you know so like I think that it's it's not asking too much and I, and I do think whatever work is going to be put into it is like well spent time because yeah. these are pretty big events that have happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah. I like, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I just, I have more questions, but I want to open it up to the audience, see if anybody has any questions. Sometimes we feel constrained by events that we can't go back to the city, mm-hmm. but sometimes even when you go back to the city, it's yeah. not the same. Yeah. And uh, obviously, like I, uh, I'm not Arab, nor nor have mm-hmm. I had the Palestinian experience. I'm I'm a sympathetic reader mm-hmm. who understands what it is like. But uh, from my own life, uh, I grew up in Karachi, mm-hmm. 
a, a city which now is in the throes of turmoil, but when I was growing up was wonderful and was home. Yeah. And I recently went back and felt so utterly detached and I think, you know, home is, is like a, a collection of our own memories yes. and fragments of our being there. But when we place ourselves out of a place, that place evolves on its own. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to it, you find out that even the people you knew there don't share your memories anymore and everyone's moved on. Mm -hmm. And that displacement in what was home, you know, really made me very, very alarmed. Yeah. And I, I, I noticed a lot over here as well is that, you know, there are, it's almost as if there's an internalized city and then there's the external place. Yes. Okay, I don't know how to follow up. Really <laughs> 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 That's really, really awesome. Which city do you consider home? Oh, no. Um, I <laughs> internalized or external? Both. Because I think, I think in, in some ways internalized, I feel like Beirut circa 2005. Um, but when I go back to Beirut, it's, it's not my city anymore. You know, it's not, it's just not. Um, and and part of it is, like you said, the people that remained have sort of moved on and part of it, it's just to become even more westernized in some ways. And um, But there's, it's just a, it's a very complicated relationship to it. And then I think externally, I mean, I've been in New York now longer than I've been anywhere else. Um, and I find that, I was talking about this recently actually with, with a friend that I, I do feel like it's becoming more like a home base. But if I really stop and think about it, I don't think that has anything to do with the city. I think it's because my brothers moved there. My sister just started college there. My aunts moved there. My parents are talking about moving there. I met and married someone there. I like I think I've made it a home, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I do, I think f I've be been happier in recent years as I've started to, like you're saying, let go of this idea that there is a geographical place, um, because I don't think there is anymore. I don't think there ever was, but I think that the, I, I sort of really <laughs> held on to the idea that there would be a place. And you know, for a long time it was Beirut, and then it was it was New York, and then it was this, it was that. And I think there was something that happened to me when my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago, where it was just like, oh, that's. I just sort of was like, Beirut has nothing left for me anymore, which is sort of a very dramatic thing to say. Um, but it really did feel that way. And I think that spoke to how much it was about like what I inherited from my grandmother and like the legacy and, and the idea of like, you know, certain recipes and language and being able to tell certain stories around people who will get those references and will be able to finish the sentence for you. Um, that I think that that's become sort of what I think of when I think of home more. Yeah, thank you for that beautifully said question. <laughs> yeah. um, so first, thank you. Um, and for specifically, thank you for the comment you made about like, seeing oppression outside of our own like as a Palestinian that like really resonated with me seeing that like you know especially in the American context we are complicit with so many other oppressions and um thinking about like the, that made that comment made me think about like your one of your poems Oklahoma for instance mm -hmm. and like that's um and that portrait of like the diasporic Palestinian within that setting and yeah. um uh, and as someone who's more, much more familiar with your poetry than your prose, mm -hmm. um, w how did your poetry, I guess, like not even just thematically, but like craft-wise or process or however we want to take it, how did your poetry, like I guess, inform the process of this book? Yeah. Process-wise, I mean, I, I think that I had to start thinking of writing prose as just being a thing million little poems <laughs> um, because I don't so I don't have any discipline when it comes to writing poetry because for me I'm very lucky in this way I just I'll wait I feel inspired I'll sit down I'll write a poem and then it's this wonderful instant gratification because you have a poem to show for it and you can be like look I did this thing <laughs> relatively <laughs> quickly whereas I find I find that prose is the opposite it's not gratifying even by the time the book came out I'm like I forgot that I wrote this but like it was so long ago. like it just it feels so distant at that point um, that there isn't that so for me, it was like I have to make the process gratifying or else there's no point in doing this. And I I found that process-wise, if I can make the fiction writing the thing I'm not supposed to be doing, then I'm good. So like when I was working on my dissertation, I would earn, if I if I did like two hours of dissertation work, I earned half an hour of writing poetry. So, like, so, that, so that tradition is kind of continued, which is I write for half an hour a day. And I don't, it's, it's just enough where I can get into something good and I usually try to leave it on like a, cliffhanger for myself and then it's but it's not so much that I dread sitting down and doing the whole process of it um, but I think that 
the the thing I've borrowed most from poetry is probably just trying to think of everything as like this is a dis- just describe this one moment mm-hmm. right like describe this one conversation mm-hmm. what did their face say like when they said what did their face look like when they said that what did mm-hmm. their whatever um, which is very much what being a poet is it's like really paying attention and being curious and so I think that adapted to fiction worked well for me are you comfortable sharing what the the book that you're working on now is about sure um, it's a it's so it's two stories told at once so it's one is in the 1960s a woman in Damascus who wants to be an actress and move to Hollywood um, and then meets this sort of meets and falls in love with somebody and then the civil war happens in Lebanon and kind of gets really kind of caught up in that and then eventually immigrates and settle immigrates to California settles down but then has a completely different life than the one that she imagined and so that story is told simultaneously as the one in present day, which is her adult children are now going to sell their ancestral house in Beirut and kind of uncovering all these family secrets. And yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I learned one thing from this book, which is like plot, which this does not have a lot of. So like now I like I think I like went all the way in the other direction and I was like all plot. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's been fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> about identity and how complicated it is and it really spoke to me because as a, a young child I lived in Palestine oh, really? and then I lived in Lebanon and then I came here and the complexity of that and, yeah. and my family's from Scotland oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> I'll also print it yeah so the complexity of that identity is um, you know it's, it's of course. Uh, a, a different parts in your life, you kind of are drawn to different parts of it, yes. and you kind of played that out in the different generations, and yeah, I, I think really you. liked the way you did it. Thank you so much for saying that, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's really like, it's funny how the things you think are a curse end up being like a blessing in your life, like I, I remember moving so much as a kid, and just like volleying back and forth between the Middle East and the States, and just it was the bane of my existence, and I felt like such an outcast. And then when it came time to write something like this, it was perfect because it was like, oh, I mean, of course you can be an Oklahoman when you're 11, and then a Beiruti <laughs> girl when you're 19, and that, like, of course that's normal. <laughs> like a life, life is long. <laughs> you can be all sorts of things. Yeah. Well, I have one last question. Sure. So, who are some of the writers? Because we're in a bookstore, I have to ask. But writers, I start books, to sweat but... as soon as people ask this because I can't. It's like I've never read a book in my life. <laughs> um, continue the question really slowly so I can think right. while you're talking. <laughs> so it could be books of poetry, okay. or it could be novels. Okay. Or, you know, maybe when you were working on this, was there mm. even even songs? I mean, I, I'm always curious about what you're what being kind very of, generous. Well, <laughs> but I'm curious because a lot of I think a lot of writers, you know, they have a soundtrack that they listen to when they're working mm-hmm. on a book or something yeah, like yeah. that. So is there something that I actually mm-hmm. did, I mean, I did. I I hounded my father so much during the writing of this because it was like, what was playing? Do you remember what was playing in the summer of 1976? And he's like, it's three o'clock in the morning, my time. <laughs> Can you please stop sending me these texts? No, I don't. Look it up. So there's a lot of like listening. I would like look up the music of different times mm-hmm. um, and and play it while I was working on those sections. So that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in terms of books, I mean, I I found the Joy Luck Club to be transformative, mm-hmm. and I read it relatively young. Um, and I was like this 11 year old brown kid that was like, yes, this is <laughs> I, I I can resonate with this so intensely and. Um, and of course, like Jhumpa Lahiri. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of like poets now. There's so many. <laughs> There's just so many. There are so many. There's so many. <laughs> wow. I've. I mean, I've been reading. I've been reading Salma Sharif. Mm, um, yes, look she's fantastic. For the second time now, and it's been mm-hmm. really, really like very moving. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first time I read it was more kind of in awe of what she did with the work and the craft and Will the structure. Talk about look a little now bit because like, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, think I think now it's, it's been incredible. more like I'm just reading it in a more just from like an emotional place, mm-hmm. so more like content versus um, structure. And it's been it's just so moving, mm-hmm. which I think I missed the first time around. I was mm-hmm. too busy kind of marveling at how she did what she did. Yeah. Um, but that's a really, yeah, that's well, really Well, she's looking at, like, words specifically that are used. Um, yeah. In it's the like the defensive, um, 
Department of Defense's like the, uh, dictionary, basically, mm-hmm. like words that are used that are that reference, you know, like a, a bomb that hasn't exploded or, you know, a target or whatever. And then kind of reclaiming that language and playing with that language mm-hmm. and doing something completely different with it. Um, both taking it back. And, and that's what's cool about how she does it is that she's both reclaiming it and allowing it to mean what it's what it also has been designated to mean by this group of individuals at the mm-hmm. same time. So each poem can kind of be read in like multiple ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful collection. Well, yeah. I think that's all I've got. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for coming up. <laughs>